you know. No, you don't know. Isn't that a terrible way to start something? <laughs> you know, no, I don't know. Why are you saying I know? I don't even know what you're going to say. So how do I know? <laughs> you guys are awesome. And gals. Okay. Men and women. Ladies and gentlemen, however you want me to address you. You're awesome when it comes to giving in this church. Over the years, we've had people leave and sometimes wonder, are we going to be able to continue to meet the needs of this church? And somehow, you just allow God to use you and work for you and continue to meet the needs of this church. And so I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in that regard. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, faithfulness a little bit. <coughs> Noah and the Flood. It's just just a children's story, you think? <laughs> Why do we love to tell this story to children? It's always at Sunday school. The animal, you know, all the water, the animals and everything. It's just a fun story, isn't it? <laughs> to share in Sunday school. Well, let's see this morning what we're going to cover. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor. In the eyes of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we're thankful for the scripture this morning. We're thankful for Noah's faithfulness and obedience and his righteousness. Lord, uh, help us to be faithful and obedient and righteous as well. And I pray that this truth this morning does not fall on deaf ears, but our ears are open and our hearts are open. Give us eyes to see in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I had something else up there, and I feel like God gave me this to change this question. I was going to say, how strong is your faith? And then this morning as I was in here preparing, this came to my mind. So there must be a reason why God wants me to ask this question. How do you measure success? Now, for yourself, you may measure it differently than you do for somebody else. What about church? How do you measure? Is this a successful? Would you call this a successful church? Would you call it an unsuccessful church? Well, it comes back to what criteria are we using to measure success, right? The standard criteria or the common for church is the size. So if we go by numbers, I would have to say we're not a successful church. Now, if we left here and went down to Praise Assembly, or Family Worship Center, maybe, we'd say, now this is a successful church. Because they got 300, 400 people here, so this must be a successful church. And I'm not saying that's not. I have friends that attend Praise Assembly. I have friends that attend Family Worship Center, and I hear good things about both churches. But I don't think they're measuring that church success by how many people are there. But even pastors, when you meet, I go to a pastor's retreat when we went a couple years ago to Hatfield, Arkansas. You know, the first thing pastors, you meet them from around the country, first thing what do they want to ask you, how many people attend your church? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, I'm going to size you up according to how many people attend church to see how good a pastor you are. Mm. You know, it used to be we uh, growing up, it was always when you meet somebody, they always say, what do you do for a living? And they would size you up according 
to what your job was. If you're a doctor, oh man, you must be really a, a great person because you're a doctor. Hmm. You know, well, I, you know, I haul garbage. Oh, you must be a terrible person yeah. because uh, you haul, you know. Then we would, we would say, so what does, how do we measure success? <clears throat> you know, what are the things? Is it earthly things? Is it the things we own? You know, um, in Taiwan, because ever because of the density of housing, you know, almost everybody lives in an apartment. <clears throat> so, people status was not by your house. Status was by the car. And if you had money, you drove a Mercedes Benz. That was it in Taiwan. If you had money, that's how you displayed you had money. You drove a Mercedes Benz. Does that mean a person successful? You know, some people think you know Bill Gates. You know. Successful. Well, yeah, he's successful, but that doesn't mean I want to be like him. Right. You know. Um, so the reason I put this up, we're talking about faith today. If if this church is a faithful church to God, would you say it's successful? Mm -hmm. What about your own lives? If you're a faithful believer and you trust and rely on God, would you call that success? Or would you call it success only if you live in a fancy house or drove a nice car? Okay. So I think this whole word success, you know, you, you can look at it many different ways. <clears throat> now there was people in Noah's day living that probably felt they were successful. But how did God see them? Did he see them as successful? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> I think we all know the answer to this. I just read it to you, right? Why did the flood come? Well, if we just look at the scripture from Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So there's like two. Only evil, and not only was their thoughts only evil, but it was all the time. These are the words of God. Only evil, all the time. Pretty messed up world, right? Not like today. <laughs> <clears throat> if we continue in the scripture, and we're looking at verses 9 to 14, it goes on to say, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, realize, Noah was not perfect. Okay? But compared to everybody else, <laughs> you know, he was seen as blameless and righteous. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for all the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. And the pitch, of course, that's what made it waterproof. That's why you had to use the pitch. <laughs> Wicked, evil, terrible times. Everybody was involved in evil. And all their thoughts were evil. But somehow Noah stood out. Noah lived a blameless life. And so God first was looking to destroy everything and everybody. <laughs> But then he looks at Noah and figures Noah is worth salvaging. Okay. Noah is worth saving. He and his family. Kind of like you, you study Israel, the remnant. That was, they use the word remnant that's left behind. That's Noah and his family. They're the remnant that God's going to leave behind to start a new generation. Build an ark. Anybody ever built a boat? 
we had some engineers here that could probably figure it out how to do it. And he obeyed. And it only took him 100 years to do it. No menial task. Now, somebody may argue the point. I've seen other theologians say, well, it doesn't really say it took him 100 years. We can kind of take inference from the scripture. He started when it was 500, and then at 601 is when he, he dry land appears again. So that's kind of where it's taken from. So the general <coughs> interpretation is it probably took him 100 years. Now, he could have hired people to help him. Even if they didn't believe in what he was doing, if he was able to pay him money, you know, he might have had workers. We don't know. It was just him. He had sons that helped him or not, or what. But it's hard to imagine that he could have taken on this big of, of construction project totally on his own. <clears throat> Even though it did take 100 years or so, we believe, to build it. Because here's the size of that ark. Everybody knows a football field. I've even run from one, one end of the football field to the other. I scored a touchdown doing that one time. But, <laughs> in a long ways. <laughs> now, our aircraft carriers, our biggest ones, are, I think, three, three times the size of a football field. But here we're talking back in those days of something one and a half times. There was nothing. Absolutely nothing that could even compare to this size of the boat. There may have been fishing boats made as long as 127 feet. Okay. So what's that? 30 yards, 40 yards, not even 35 yards. And football, we're talking football field now of 150, football and a half. So nothing was even remotely in comparison to that. <clears throat> and as high as a four-story building. This thing is huge. This thing is huge. We, recently, I was, uh, I've been remodeling our kitchen. I was doing kitchen cabinets, which became somewhat of a monumental task. <laughs> because I can only do parts at a time. I to, and so it took me Four, it almost took me three to four months before I finally finished the kitchen cabinets. And I was working a little bit each day on them. And, and I'm like, you know, you start wondering, am I ever going to complete this? You know? But I, I just focused on each day. If I could just do this much today, if I can just do this much, then I, I can see I'm progressing <laughs> towards a goal. But I if I focused just on the goal, it would be overwhelming. It's like, I'm never going to get this done. So maybe that's what Noah did. Maybe it's just like, okay, if we get this part, we just continue working each day as much as we can do and not worry about how long it's going to take. Now, this is interesting. The ark was six times longer than it is wide. Okay? Think about that for a minute. Six times longer than it is wide. It's the exact same ratio shipbuilders use today. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Back then! <coughs> so obviously this didn't come out of Noah just think this up. But the same ratio that they used to build the ark that God gave the plans to do is the same way ratio that they use today for modern shipbuilding. Yeah, preach without effect. Hopefully that doesn't go on here, but... <laughs> Um, Noah, okay, no after. Noah was trying to save people. He was trying to get them to turn to the Lord. Now, that's different than him saying, oh, come join us on the ark. Okay, because God didn't say it. God said, I got room for eight. You know? He didn't say it was, you know, it could take in hundreds of people. But Noah was trying to preach to the people. Day of judgment is coming. You think they accepted it? Noah's obedience saved him, and he's a biblical example of faith, but people didn't listen. 
500 years old when we started building this thing. So what's that like today? Would that be like 50 today? I don't know. So you went to what, 800, 900? <coughs> Five year, 500 years old, and then God gives them this monumental task to build this ark. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Do you ever wonder when you read this, who in the heck are the sons of God? I'll give you an interpretation I have. No. <laughs> That's what a lot of people think. Because it's clear in scripture, angels didn't, don't marry. They don't marry, okay. I think what it was was is Seth's sons married to Cain's descendants. Then he's talking about the sons of God coming from the line of Seth, right? Remember we talked about that line of Abel and Seth was the godly line, and Cain's line was the ungodly line, and um, that they began to intermarry, okay. And we see throughout the Old Testament, time and time again, the Israelites remarry people that were worshiping other gods and other idols, that they became corrupt. They were influenced by the people who they married. And so there's, there's reason, you know, when God says, you know, we have to marry someone else equally yoked, that type of thing, meaning somebody else that's a Christian, because if not, it can lead us astray. Okay. And this is through history. So the sons of God, or what we believe are Seth's descendants, were weakened <laughs> faithfully. They were influenced by their spouses. And moral decay began to take place in the culture at the time. And result, evil becomes the norm instead of the exception. Almost sounds like today's culture, doesn't it? Evil becomes the norm right. and not the exception. Right. <clears throat> and then God said their normal lifespan would be no more than 120 years. Well, they lived longer. I mean, they lived 800 some years. But this, we believe, is the time he's saying that's left on earth before the flood comes when he makes a statement that you have 120 years to repent. Mm -hmm. You know. And it does not take place <clears throat> to change from your sinful ways to turn to God. I'd say a pretty patient God. Do you think that's a pretty patient God? Mm -hmm. Of course, for today, you know, we say maybe today it'd be 12 years or 10 years or something. Okay, you have 10 years okay. according to our lifespan compared to the lifespan then. But time still ran out. Flood waters came. But here's the question for you this morning. How long has God been patient with you? Is your time about to run out? God is a patient. <laughs> Praise God. He is a patient God. A loving and graceful God. But he's only patient so long. Now here, now we're going to... See. This, I'm really struggling with this word regret, okay? And I'll tell you why in a minute. Did God regret creating humanity? Because when I hear the word regret, that means to me that God's admitting he made a mistake. And how could a perfect God make a mistake, okay? But if we look in the Amplified Edition, it says... So the Lord said, I will destroy anomaly, mankind whom I have created from the surface of the earth, not only man, but the animals and the crawling things and the birds of the air, because it deeply grieves me to see mankind's sin. And I regret that I have made them. <laughs> so it says I regret that I made them. But he, there's deep sorrow there expressed by God. That man has turned away from God. Sounds kind of like Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Rebellion has taken over. 
and they have chose something other than God. I don't think God's admitted he made a mistake or changed his mind because if you look at 1 Samuel 15, it says, He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. But I do, it sounds like another word for regret can be uh, deep sorrow and maybe not regret of what he did as much as regret of what man did in turning away from him mm -hmm. and what the people have done. And he's deeply sorrowful that they chose sin and death over him. Just to say today, God has deep sorrow for anyone that chooses sin and death over him. Sin should be no news, grieves God. It separates us from God. It breaks God's heart when we sin. Righteous, blameless. But yet we know for Noah, he still had some sin because he was not perfect. But God considered him righteous and righteous and blameless. And here's what, you know, we talked about this again this morning. We make mistakes. We've all made mistakes. We all probably regret some things that we have done that we wish we had never done in our lives. But God's looking at your heart today. Do you love God? Do you want to please God? Sure, sometimes we may get off the track. But what's your, what's your heart? Is it loving God? Do you want to obey God? Do you want to follow God? Do you try? Do you make the effort? Do you have faith in God? Or do we go the other direction, in, which is rebellion, which we don't trust God, we don't have faith in God, and we decide we're going to do it our own way, thinking that may be the best way. So how faithful was Noah? It took him a hundred years, we figured, to build the ark. So he's busy building this ark. You ever think he made these water? How am I going to get all these animals? You know how many animals they think could fit in that ark? 45,000. <laughs> He said it might boggle. <laughs> but here's the thing. Sometimes God puts a task in front of us. He says, okay, this is what I want you to do. Do you ever get caught up in the details? Or do you just go ahead and do what God wants you to do? We, uh, the story just came, just came out of mind right now. When we first went to Taiwan, and we were looking for a house, and we looked at this one house, and... We're like, yeah, okay, it's okay, whatever. And then we realized it had no kitchen. Yeah, no kitchen. There was a room. There was no cabinets. There was no sink. Just a hot water heater. That was, that was all that. And we needed air conditioning, which we uh, didn't have. And so God says, we pray about it. God says, I want you to live in this house. And first thought, well, we don't have a kitchen. You know, I'm going to need air conditioning. How's that going to happen? You know, and God just, God's just saying, I want you to live in that house. Okay. <laughs> we did it. You know what happened? God provided the kitchen. God provided the air conditioning. People stepped up in donations and covered the whole cost. Now, if we got caught up in the deep, we would have probably said, oh, we can't move in there because we can't afford it. See, see the difference? So God's telling them, no, build this ark. And you, all these animals are going to come. But if Noah got caught up in how am I going to get these animals here, he probably would have got behind in construction and may have stopped altogether. So we're not really sure how the animals got the ark, but I'm sure God had something to do with it. He may have just drawn them there. You know, there may have been nothing no one needed to do. He just brought them there. I don't know. But Noah had to go through water ridicule. Can you imagine? You idiot! What the heck are you doing? Why are you wasting all your time building that big boat? 
You're, it's on dry land. You're not even near the water. Oh my gosh. This guy's an idiot. You know? How stupid can you be? You should be out here enjoying life. You know? Come out with us. Let's go party. Let's go have fun. But no, you've set up all your time and your effort in building this ridiculous boat. Does anybody get mocked or ridiculed today <laughs> for your faith? <clears throat> yeah, we live in a very evil world right now. Mm -hmm. And the people may be saying something similar to you. You know, why do you believe in a fairy tale? Why do you believe in something that doesn't exist that you can't touch, you can't feel? Why do you waste your time going to church on something? Josephus, he comes up quite often. He was an historian of the day, and he was not a Christian. He was not a God-fearing man, but he's he has a reputation of being a good historian, okay, uh, well-respected. So sometimes it's nice to introduce what he has to say that's outside Scripture or the Bible. And he said, but Noah was very uneasy about what they did. And being displeased by their conduct, persuaded them to change their dispositions for the better. But, seeing that they did not yield to him, he departed out of the land. So again, Noah tried. Nobody would listen. Warned thousands of God's judgment coming. People did not. People did not believe, just like today, people did not believe. Not only did they deny him, what they tried to do, they'll try to convince you that your beliefs are stupid. They try to convince him his beliefs are stupid. They try to sway you to their way. Instead of trusting God for deliverance, whether it's then or it's today. God is our deliverer. And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Amen. Guys, that'd be great on a tombstone. Dave did everything just as God commanded him. Well, I'd love to have that on my tombstone. That'd be great. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day. Has God ever rescued you in your trials? Yeah. The flood. As a result of the flood, a new beginning was to start again. Judgment took place. Final judgment we face is not going to be any different. If we've trusted in God, then we've got nothing to be concerned about. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. He is a patient God, not wanting anyone, no one, absolutely none, to perish, but everyone to you think he, he did this flood because he wanted everyone to die? Don't you think he'd be much happier if they all would have come to repentance and he didn't have to wipe out the face of the earth? I thought every culture had a flood story, and that's not true. When I was researching Africa, I guess, I don't have flood stories, but there's a lot of places, especially in Europe, most uh, have a flood story. Some of it they, they view as something regional, because I don't know how they would know if it was regional or not. But, um, but a lot of cultures do have a story of this great flood that took place in history. <clears throat> God's justice. Not our justice. God's grace. It's real. It's real. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? What 
kind of people should we be? Holy, godly people. To live lives that bring honor and glory to God. Godliness. That's what God's looking for in us. Then, that's what God's looking in us now. Are you leading a life that brings glory to God? That is godly. And finally, Jeremiah 31 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the kingdoms of Israel and Judah with the offspring of people and of animals. Just as I watched over them to uproot, tear down, and to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. So here we look at God is interested more than just salvation. He's interested in salvaging. Salvaging you, salvaging <coughs> our lives. Creating remnant of his people. Noah's family was saved. They were the remnant he saved to build the future generations. To salvage the world. He retrieved what is valuable. And that was righteous, blameless, God-fearing people. That's how he acted. He saved them from sin and condemnation because of their faith to serve. Faith in the Lord so that they could offer service to the Lord. Now it's the time of invitation. <clears throat> what we see in the story with Noah is a man that was faithful and obedient. God asked for nothing less from us today. To put our faith in him and to be obedient to his call on our lives. And so we're going to show this video right now. If you need prayer, um, feel free to call one of us to come pray with you or come up. And um, let's reflect a little bit on what faith was. God of the impossible. Hmm. Anybody want to go see the ark? Yeah. You know they built a replica of yeah. it? Wow. A life-size replica. Look at how small the people look. <laughs> wow. In Williamstown, Kentucky. We're going to go one year. And I see that uh, our daughter's in St. Louis, and we actually from here go through St. Louis to go on to Williamstown so I'm thinking no, we'll go combine it with a visit to her one time but yeah I know somebody uh, that went and saw it and said it was pretty neat but, yeah. I just want to go gosh you look at I mean look at this size of the thing it's like, something enormous isn't it yeah, it is. yeah. so let's pray so anyway okay so Anybody rolling up the trousers for the water coming in? Okay. Let's <laughs> uh, all uh, stand. <clears throat> Janae's been really good about putting the prayer in the bulletin in case you, if you want to ever look back at it uh, during the week. I like this corporate prayer. I think it's good for us and good for the church. Start with Father. You have loved me and called me to be your royal follower and to find my true pressure. Pleasure, I'm sorry. And to find my true pleasure in your revealed will. Help me to grow in areas that I do not have enough faith to trust in you and your goodness. Forgive me. Whoops. <laughs> Forgive me for not realizing that you know what is best for me and that I do not. Keep me from being a stumbling block to others and empower me to walk in your ways and power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. Lord, we just thankful this morning for everyone that's here. Lord, we thankful for the hearts to serve you, to walk in faith to turn their hearts over to you, to trust in you, Lord. Help us in those areas that we falter. Help us in those areas that we are weak and we need encouraged, we need strengthened, Lord. You know what's best for us. Help us to willingly admit that, that you know what's best for us, and we do not. 
and to know your loving grace and mercy that you bestow on us each and every day. Lord, help us in those uh, areas that we just stumble. And whether we stumble or we're stumbling, walk to others. Help us, help our hearts, Lord, to be open to receive you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, uh, where am I? Oh gosh, my memory just went. Where am I? Oh, Northside Christian Church. No. <laughs> Maria, I'm going to let you go ahead. And... We're going to sing. Oh, we're going to sing. See, okay. I'm lost. I'm... <laughs> That's okay. I knew something I was, I was forgetting something. Who, who would, okay, let's sing. Come on, we need to sing out. <laughs> this is a song of great rejoicing. A lot of churches only sing this at Easter time, but I tell you what, it's appropriate every single day. Yeah, every single day.